Section 1 of Dreams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Noel Badrian Dreams by Olive Schreiner To a small girl child who may live to grasp somewhat of that which for us is yet sight, not touch. Note. These dreams are printed in the order in which they were written. In the case of two, there was a lapse of some years between the writing of the first and last parts. These are placed according to the date of the first part. Olive Schreiner Magius Fontaine, Cape Colony, South Africa, November 1890 Chapter 1 The Lost Joy All day, where the sunlight played on the seashore, life sat. All day, the soft wind played with her hair, and the young, young face looked out across the water. She was waiting. She was waiting, but she could not tell for what. All day the waves ran up and up on the sand, and ran back again, and the pink shells rolled. Life sat waiting. All day, with the sunlight in her eyes, she sat there, till, grown weary, she laid her head upon her knee and fell asleep, waiting still. Then a keel grated on the sand, and then a step was on the shore. Life awoke and heard it. A hand was laid upon her, and a great shudder passed through her. She looked up and saw over her the strange wide eyes of love, and life now knew for whom she had sat there waiting. And love drew life up to him and of that meeting was born a thing rare and beautiful joy first joy was it called the sunlight when it shines upon the merry water is not so glad the rosebuds when they turn back their lips for the sun's first kiss are not so ruddy its tiny pulses beat quick it was so warm so soft it never spoke but it laughed and played in the sunshine, and love and life rejoiced exceedingly. Neither whispered it to the other, but deep in its own heart each said, It shall be ours forever. Then there came a time, was it after weeks, was it after months? Love and life do not measure time, when the thing was not as it had been. Still it played, still it laughed, still it stained its mouth with purple berries. But sometimes the little hands hung weary, and the little eyes looked out heavily across the water. And life and love dared not look into each other's eyes, dared not say, What ails our darling? Each heart whispered to itself, It is nothing, it is nothing. Tomorrow it will laugh out clear. But tomorrow and tomorrow came. They journeyed on, and the child played beside them, but heavily, more heavily. One day life and love lay down to sleep, and when they awoke it was gone. Only near them on the grass sat a little stranger with wide open eyes, very soft and sad. Neither noticed it, but they walked apart, weeping bitterly. Oh, our joy, our lost joy, shall we see you no more forever? The little soft and sad-eyed stranger slipped a hand into one hand of each, and drew them closer, and life and love walked on with it between them and when life looked down in anguish she saw her tears reflected in its soft eyes and when love mad with pain cried out i am weary i am weary i can journey no further 
the light is all behind the dark is all before a little rosy finger pointed where the sunlight lay upon the hillsides always its large eyes were sad and thoughtful always the little brave mouth was smiling quietly when on the sharp stones life cut her feet he wiped the blood upon his garments and kissed the wounded feet with his little lips when in the desert love lay down faint for love itself grows faint he ran over the hot sand with his little naked feet and even there in the desert found water in the holes in the rocks to moisten love's lips with he was no burden he never waited them he only helped them forward on their journey when they came to the dark ravine where the icicles hang from the rocks for love and life must pass through strange drear places there where all is cold and the snow lies thick he took their freezing hands and held them against his beating little heart and warmed them and softly he drew them on and on and when they came beyond into the land of sunshine and flowers strangely the great eyes lit up and dimples broke out upon the face brightly laughing it ran over the soft grass gathered honey from the hollow tree and brought it to them on the palm of its hand carried them water in the leaves of the lily and gathered flowers and wreathed them round their heads softly laughing all the while he touched them as their joy had touched them but his fingers clung more tenderly so they wandered on through the dark lands and the light always with that little brave smiling one between them sometimes they remembered that first radiant joy and whispered to themselves oh could we but find him also at last they came to where reflection sits that strange old woman who has always one elbow on her knee and her chin in her hand and who steals light out of the past to shed it on the future and life and love cried out o oh, wise one tell us when first we met a lovely radiant thing belonged to us gladness without a tear sunshine without a shade oh how did we sin that we lost it where shall we go that we may find it and she the wise old woman answered to have it back will you give up that which walks beside you now and in agony love and life cried no give up this said life when the thorns have pierced me who will suck the poison out when my head throbs who will lay his tiny hands upon it and still the beating in the cold and the dark who will warm my freezing heart and love cried out better let me die without joy i can live without this i cannot let me rather die not lose it and the wise old woman answered o oh, fools and blind what you once had is that which you have now when love and life first meet a radiant thing is born without a shade when the road begins to roughen when the shades begin to darken when the days are hard and the nights cold and long then it begins to change love and life will not see it will not know it till one day they start up suddenly crying o oh god o oh god we have lost it where is it they do not understand that they could not carry the laughing thing unchanged into the desert and the frost and the snow they do not know that what walks beside them still is the joy grown older the grave sweet tender thing warm in the coldest snows brave in the dreariest deserts its name is sympathy it is the perfect love South Africa End of section 1
Section two of Dreams by Olive Schreiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Chapter two The Hunter. In certain valleys there was a hunter. Day by day he went to hunt for wild fowl in the woods, and it chanced that once he stood on the shores of a large lake while he stood waiting in the rushes for the coming of the birds a great shadow fell on him and in the water he saw a reflection he looked up to the sky but the thing was gone then a burning desire came over him to see once again that reflection in the water and all day he watched and waited but night came and it had not returned then he went home with his empty bag moody and silent his comrades came questioning about him to know the reason but he answered them nothing he sat alone and brooded then his friend came to him and to him he spoke i have seen today he said that which i never saw before a vast white bird with silver wings outstretched sailing in the everlasting blue and now it is as though a great fire burnt within my breast it was but a sheen a shimmer a reflection in the water but now i desire nothing more on earth than to hold her his friend laughed it was but a beam playing on the water or the shadow of your own head Tomorrow you will forget her, he said. But tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow the hunter walked alone. He sought in the forest and in the woods, by the lakes and among the rushes, but he could not find her. He shot no more wild fowl. What were they to him? What ails him? said his comrades. He is mad, said one. No, but he is worse said another he would see that which none of us have seen and make himself a wonder come let us forswear his company said all so the hunter walked alone one night as he wandered in the shade very heart sore and weeping an old man stood before him grander and taller than the sons of men who are you asked the hunter i am wisdom answered the old man but some men call me knowledge all my life i have grown in these valleys but no man sees me till he has sorrowed much the eyes must be washed with tears that are to behold me and according as a man has suffered i speak and the hunter cried o oh, you who have lived here so long tell me what is that great wild bird i have seen sailing in the blue they would have me believe she is a dream the shadow of my own head the old man smiled her name is truth he who has once seen her never rests again till death he desires her and the hunter cried oh tell me where i may find her but the old man said you have not suffered enough and went then the hunter took from his breast the shuttle of imagination and wound on it the thread of his wishes and all night he sat and wove a net in the morning he spread the golden net upon the ground and into it he threw a few grains of credulity which his father had left him and which he kept in his breast pocket they were like white puff balls and when you trod on them a brown dust flew out then he sat by to see what would happen the first that came into the net was a snow-white bird with dove's eyes and he sang a beautiful song a human god a human god a human god it sang the second that came was black and mystical with dark lovely eyes that looked into the depths of your soul and he sang only this 
immortality. And the hunter took them both in his arms, for he said, They are surely of the beautiful family of truth. Then came another, green and gold, who sang in a shrill voice like one crying in the marketplace, Reward after death, reward after death. And he said, You are not so fair, but you are fair too. And he took it. And others came, brightly coloured, singing pleasant songs, till all the grains were finished. And the hunter gathered all his birds together, and built a strong iron cage called a new creed, and put all his birds in it. Then the people came about dancing and singing. O oh, happy hunter, they cried, O oh, wonderful man, O oh, delightful birds, O oh, lovely songs. No one asked where the birds had come from, nor how they had been caught, but they danced and sang before them, and the hunter too was glad, for he said, Surely truth is among them. In time she will molt her feathers, and I shall see her snow-white form. But the time passed, and the people sang and danced, but the hunter's heart grew heavy. He crept alone as of old to weep. The terrible desire had awakened again in his breast. One day, as he sat alone weeping, it chanced that wisdom met him. He told the old man what he had done, and wisdom smiled sadly. Many men, he said, have spread that net for truth, but they have never found her. On the grains of credulity she will not feed. In the net of wishes her feet cannot be held. In the air of these valleys she will not breathe. The birds you have caught are of the brood of lies, lovely and beautiful, but still lies. Truth knows them not. And the hunter cried out in bitterness, And must I then sit still, to be devoured of this great burning? And the old man said, Listen, and in that you have suffered much, and wept much, I will tell you what I know. He who sets out to search for truth, must leave these valleys of superstition for ever, taking with him not one shred that has belonged to them. Alone he must wander down into the land of absolute negation and denial. He must abide there. He must resist temptation. When the light breaks, he must arise and follow it into the country of dry sunshine. The mountains of stern reality will rise before him. He must climb them. Beyond them lies truth. And he will hold her fast, he will hold her in his hands, the hunter cried. Wisdom shook his head. He will never see her, never hold her. The time is not yet. Then there is no hope, cried the hunter. There is this, said Wisdom. Some men have climbed on those mountains. Circle above circle of bare rock they have scaled. And wandering there in those high regions, some have chanced to pick up on the ground one white silver feather dropped from the wing of truth. And it shall come to pass, said the old man, raising himself prophetically and pointing with his finger to the sky, it shall come to pass that when enough of those silver feathers have been gathered by the hands of men and shall have been woven into a cord and the cord into a net, that in that net truth may be captured. Nothing but truth can hold truth. The hunter arose. I will go, he said. But wisdom detained him. Mark you well. Who leaves these valleys never returns to them, though he should weep tears of blood seven days and nights upon the confines, he can never put his foot across them. Left, they are left forever. Upon the road which you would travel, there is no reward offered. Who goes, goes freely, for the great love that is in him. The work is his reward. I go, said the hunter. 
but upon the mountains tell me which path shall i take i am the child of the accumulated knowledge of ages said the man i can walk only where many men have trodden on these mountains few feet have passed each man strikes out a path for himself he goes at his own peril my voice he hears no more i may follow after him but i cannot go before him then knowledge vanished and the hunter turned he went to his cage and with his hands broke down the bars and the jagged iron tore his flesh it is sometimes easier to build than to break one by one he took his plumed birds and let them fly but when he came to his dark plumed bird he held it and looked into its beautiful eyes and the bird uttered its low deep cry immortality and he said quickly i cannot part with it it is not heavy it eats no food i will hide it in my breast i will take it with me and he buried it there and covered it over with his cloak but the thing he had hidden grew heavier 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 till it lay on his breast like lead he could not move with it he could not leave those valleys with it then again he took it out and looked at it oh my beautiful my heart's own he cried may i not keep you he opened his hand sadly go he said it may happen that in truth's song one note is like yours but i shall never hear it sadly he opened his hand and the bird flew from him forever then from the shuttle of imagination he took the thread of his wishes and threw it on the ground and the empty shuttle he put into his breast for the thread was made in those valleys but the shuttle came from an unknown country he turned to go but now the people came about him howling fool hound demented lunatic they cried how dare you break your cage and let the birds fly the hunter spoke but they would not hear him truth who is she can you eat her can you drink her who has ever seen her your birds were real all could hear them sing oh fool vile reptile atheist they cried you pollute the air come let us take up stones and stone him cried some what affair is it of ours said others let the idiot go and went away but the rest gathered up stones and mud and threw at him at last when he was bruised and cut the hunter crept away into the woods and it was evening about him he wandered on and on and the shade grew deeper he was on the borders now of the land where it is always night then he stepped into it and there was no light there with his hands he groped but each branch as he touched it broke off and the earth was covered with cinders at every step his foot sank in and a fine cloud of impalpable ashes flew up into his face and it was dark so he sat down upon a stone and buried his face in his hands to wait in the land of negation and denial till the light came and it was night in his heart also then from the marshes to his right and left cold mists arose and closed about him a fine imperceptible rain fell in the dark and great drops gathered on his hair and clothes his heart beat slowly and a numbness crept all through his limbs then looking up two merry wisp lights came dancing he lifted his head to look at them nearer nearer they came so warm so bright they danced like stars of fire they stood before him at last from the centre of the radiating flame in one looked out a woman's face laughing dimpled with streaming yellow hair in the centre of the other 
were merry laughing ripples like the bubbles on a glass of wine they danced before him who are you asked the hunter who alone come to me in my solitude and darkness we are the twins sensuality they cried our father's name is human nature and our mother's name is excess we are as old as the hills and rivers as old as the first man but we never die they laughed oh let me wrap my arms about you cried the first they are soft and warm your heart is frozen now but i will make it beat oh come to me i will pour my hot life into you said the second your brain is numb and your limbs are dead now but they shall live with a fierce free life oh let me pour it in oh follow us they cried and live with us nobler hearts than yours have sat here in this darkness to wait and they have come to us and we to them and they have never left us never all else is a delusion but we are real we are real truth is a shadow the valleys of superstition are a farce the earth is of ashes the trees are all rotten but we feel us we live you cannot doubt us feel us how warm we are oh come to us come with us nearer and nearer round his head they hovered and the cold drops melted on his forehead the bright light shot into his eyes dazzling him and the frozen blood began to run and he said yes why should i die here in this awful darkness they are warm they melt my frozen blood and he stretched out his hands to take them then in a moment there arose before him the image of the thing he had loved and his hand dropped to his side oh come to us they cried but he buried his face you dazzle my eyes he cried you make my heart warm but you cannot give me what i desire i will wait here wait till i die go he covered his face with his hands and would not listen and when he looked up again they were two twinkling stars that vanished in the distance and the long long night rolled on all who leave the valley of superstition pass through the dark land but some go through it in a few days some linger there for months some for years and some die there at last for the hunter a faint light played along the horizon and he rose to follow it and he reached that light at last and stepped into the broad sunshine then before him rose the almighty mountains of dry facts and realities the clear sunshine played on them and the tops were lost in the clouds at the foot many paths ran up an exultant cry burst from the hunter he chose the straightest and began to climb and the rocks and ridges resounded with his song they had exaggerated after all it was not so high nor was the road so steep a few days a few weeks a few months at most and then the top not one feather only would he pick up he would gather all that other men had found weave the net capture truth hold her fast touch her with his hands clasp her he laughed in the merry sunshine and sang loud victory was very near nevertheless after a while the path grew steeper he needed all his breath for climbing and the singing died away on the right and left rose huge rocks devoid of lichen or moss and in the lava-like earth chasms yawned here and there he saw a sheen of white bones now too the path began to grow less and less marked then it became a mere trace with a footmark here and there then it ceased altogether he sang no more but struck forth a path for himself until it reached a mighty wall of rock 
smooth and without break, stretching as far as the eye could see. I will rear a stair against it, and once this wall climbed, I shall be almost there, he said bravely, and worked. With his shuttle of imagination he dug out stones, but half of them would not fit, and half a month's work would roll down because those below were ill-chosen. But the hunter worked on, saying always to himself, Once this wall climbed, I shall be almost there, this great work ended. At last he came out upon the top, and he looked about him. Far below rolled the white mists over the valley of superstition, and above him towered the mountains. They had seemed low before. They were of an immeasurable height now, from crown to foundation surrounded by walls of rock that rose tier above tier in mighty circles. Upon them played the eternal sunshine. He uttered a wild cry. He bowed himself on to the earth and when he rose his face was white. In absolute silence he walked on. He was very silent now. In those high regions the rarefied air is hard to breathe by those born in the valleys. Every breath he drew hurt him, and the blood oozed out from the tips of his fingers. Before the next wall of rock he began to work. The height of this seemed infinite and he said nothing. The sound of his tool rang night and day upon the iron rocks into which he cut steps. Years passed over him, yet he worked on, but the wall towered up always above him to heaven. Sometimes he prayed that a little moss or lichen might spring up on those bare walls to be a companion to him, but it never came. And the years rolled on, he counted them by the steps he had cut. A few for a year, only a few. He sang no more, he said no more, I will do this or that. He only worked. And at night, when the twilight settled down, they looked out at him from the holes and crevices in the rocks, strange wild faces. Stop your work, you lonely man, and speak to us, they cried. My salvation is in work. If I should stop but for one moment, you would creep down upon me, he replied. And they put out their long necks further. Look down into the crevice at your feet, they said. See what lies there. White bones, as brave and strong a man as you climbed to these rocks. And he looked up. He saw there was no use in striving. He would never hold truth, never see her, never find her. So he lay down here, for he was very tired. He went to sleep forever. He put himself to sleep. Sleep is very tranquil. You are not lonely when you are asleep. Neither do your hands ache, nor your heart. And the hunter laughed between his teeth. Have I torn from my heart all that was dearest? Have I wandered alone in the land of night? Have I resisted temptation? Have I dwelt where the voice of my kind is never heard, and laboured alone, to lie down and be food for you, ye harpies? He laughed fiercely, and the echoes of despair slunk away, for the laugh of a brave, strong heart is as a death-blow to them. Nevertheless, they crept out again and looked at him. Do you know that your hair is white, they said, that your hands begin to tremble like a child's? Do you see that the point of your shuttle is gone? It is cracked already. If you should ever climb this stair, they said, it will be your last. You will never climb another. And he answered, I know it, and worked on. The old thin hands cut the stones ill and jaggedly, for the fingers were stiff and bent. The beauty and strength of the man was gone. At last an old, wizened, shrunken face looked out above the rocks. It saw the eternal mountains rise with walls to the white clouds. 
but its work was done. The old hunter folded his tired hands and lay down by the precipice where he had worked away his life. It was the sleeping time at last. Below him, over the valleys, rolled the thick white mist. Once it broke, and through the gap the dying eyes looked down on the trees and fields of their childhood. From afar seemed born to him the cry of his own wild birds, and he heard the noise of people singing as they danced, and he thought he heard among them the voices of his old comrades, and he saw far off the sunlight shine on his early home, and great tears gathered in the hunter's eyes. Ah, they who die there do not die alone, he cried. Then the mists rolled together again, and he turned his eyes away. I have sought, he said, for long years I have laboured, but I have not found her. I have not rested, I have not repined, and I have not seen her. Now my strength is gone. Where I lie down worn out, other men will stand young and fresh. By the steps that I have cut, they will climb. By the stairs that I have built, they will mount. They will never know the name of the man who made them. At the clumsy work they will laugh. When the stones roll, they will curse me. But they will mount, and on my work they will climb, and by my stair. They will find her, and through me. And no man liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. The tears rolled from beneath the shriveled eyelids. If truth had appeared above him in the clouds now, he could not have seen her. The mist of death was in his eyes. My soul hears their glad step coming, he said, and they shall mount, they shall mount. He raised his shriveled hand to his eyes. Then, slowly, from the white sky above, through the still air, came something falling, falling, falling. Softly it fluttered down and dropped onto the breast of the dying man. He felt it with his hands. It was a feather. He died holding it. End of section two. Section three of Dreams by Olive Schreiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Chapter three. The Gardens of Pleasure. She walked upon the beds and the sweet rich scent arose and she gathered her hands full of flowers then duty with his white clear features came and looked at her then she ceased from gathering but she walked away among the flowers smiling and with her hands full then duty with his still white face came again and looked at her but she, she turned her head away from him. At last she saw his face, and she dropped the fairest of the flowers she had held, and walked silently away. Then again he came to her, and she moaned, and bent her head low, and turned to the gate. But as she went out she looked back at the sunlight on the faces of the flowers, and wept in anguish. Then she went out, and it shut behind her forever. But still in her hand she held of the buds she had gathered, and the scent was very sweet in the lonely desert. But he followed her. Once more he stood before her with his still, white, death-like face, and she knew what he had come for. She unbent the fingers and let the flowers drop out the flowers she had loved so, and walked on without them, with dry, aching eyes. Then for the last time he came, 
and she showed him her empty hands, the hands that held nothing now, but still he looked. Then at length she opened her bosom, and took out of it one small flower she had hidden there, and laid it on the sand. She had nothing more to give now, and she wandered away, and the grey sand whirled about her. Chapter 4 in a far-off world there is a world in one of the far-off stars and things do not happen here as they happen there in that world were a man and a woman they had one work and they walked together side by side on many days and were friends and that is a thing that happens now and then in this world also but there was something in that star world that there is not here there was a thick wood where the trees grew closest and the stems were interlocked and the summer sun never shone there stood a shrine in the day all was quiet but at night when the stars shone or the moon glinted on the treetops and all was quiet below if one crept here quite alone and knelt on the steps of the stone altar and uncovering one's breast so wounded it that the blood fell down on the altar steps then whatever he who knelt there wished for was granted him and all this happens as i said because it is a far-off world and things often happen there as they do not happen here now the man and the woman walked together and the woman wished well to the man one night when the moon was shining so that the leaves of all the trees glinted and the waves of the sea were silvery the woman walked alone to the forest it was dark there the moonlight fell only in little flecks on the dead leaves under her feet and the branches were knotted tight overhead farther in it got darker not even a fleck of moonlight shone then she came to the shrine she knelt down before it and prayed there came no answer then she uncovered her breast with a sharp two-edged stone that lay there she wounded it the drops dripped slowly down on to the stone and a voice cried what do you seek she answered there is a man i hold him nearer than anything i would give him the best of all blessings the voice said what is it the girl said i know not but that which is most good for him i wish him to have the voice said your prayer is answered he shall have it then she stood up she covered her breast and held the garment tight upon it with her hand and ran out of the forest and the dead leaves fluttered under her feet out in the moonlight the soft air was blowing and the sand glittered on the beach she ran along the smooth shore then suddenly she stood still out across the water there was something moving she shaded her eyes and looked it was a boat it was sliding swiftly over the moonlit water out to sea one stood upright in it the face the moonlight did not show but the figure she knew it was passing swiftly it seemed as if no one propelled it the moonlight's shimmer did not let her see clearly and the boat was far from shore but it seemed almost as if there was another figure sitting in the stern faster and faster it glided over the water away away she ran along the shore she came no nearer it the garment she had held closed fluttered open she stretched out her arms and the moonlight shone on her long loose hair then a voice beside her whispered what is it she cried with my blood i bought the best of all gifts for him I have come to bring it him he is going from me the voice whispered softly your prayer was answered 
it has been given him. She cried, What is it? The voice answered, It is that he might leave you. The girl stood still. Far out at sea the boat was lost to sight beyond the moonlight sheen. The voice spoke softly. Art thou contented? She said, I am contented. At her feet the waves broke in long ripples softly on the shore. End of section 3section four of dreams by olive schreiner this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian chapter five three dreams in a desert under a mimosa tree as i travelled across an african plain the sun shone down hotly then i drew my horse up under a mimosa tree and I took the saddle from him, and left him to feed among the parched bushes. And all to the right and to the left stretched the brown earth. And I sat down under the tree, because the heat beat fiercely, and all along the horizon the air throbbed. And after a while a heavy drowsiness came over me, and I laid my head down against my saddle, and I fell asleep there and in my sleep I had a curious dream. I thought I stood on the border of a great desert, and the sand blew about everywhere, and I thought I saw two great figures like beasts of burden on the desert, and one lay upon the sand with its neck stretched out, and one stood by it, and I looked curiously at the one that lay upon the ground, for it had a great burden on its back, and the sand was thick about it, so that it seemed to have piled over it for centuries. And I looked very curiously at it. And there stood one beside me watching. And I said to him, What is this huge creature who lies here on the sand? And he said, This is woman, she that bears men in her body. And I said, Why does she lie here motionless, with the sand piled round her? And he answered, Listen, I will tell you. Ages and ages long she has lain here, and the wind has blown over her. The oldest, oldest, oldest man living has never seen her move. The oldest, oldest book records that she lay here then as she lies here now, with the sand about her. But listen, older than the oldest book, older than the oldest recorded memory of man, on the rocks of language, on the hard-baked clay of ancient customs, now crumbling to decay, are found the marks of her footsteps. Side by side with his who stands beside her, you may trace them, and you know that she who now lies here once wandered free over the rocks with him. And I said, Why does she lie there now? And he said, I take it, ages ago, the age of dominion of muscular force found her, and when she stooped low to give suck to her young, and her back was broad, he put his burden of subjection on to it, and tied it on with the broad band of inevitable necessity. Then she looked at the earth and the sky, and knew there was no hope for her, and she lay down on the sand with the burden she could not loosen. Ever since she has lain here, and the ages have come, and the ages have gone, but the band of inevitable necessity has not been cut. And I looked and saw in her eyes the terrible patience of the centuries. The ground was wet with her tears, and her nostrils blew up the sand. And I said, Has she ever tried to move? And he said, Sometimes a limb has quivered, but she is wise, she knows she cannot rise with the burden on her. 
and i said why does not he who stands by her leave her and go on and he said he cannot look and i saw a broad band passing along the ground from one to the other and it bound them together he said while she lies there he must stand and look across the desert and i said does he know why he cannot move and he said no and i heard a sound of something cracking and i looked and i saw the band that bound the burden on her back broken asunder and the burden rolled on to the ground and i said what is this and he said the age of muscular force is dead the age of nervous force has killed him with the knife he holds in his hand and silently and invisibly he has crept up to the woman and with that knife of mechanical invention he has cut the band that bound the burden to her back the inevitable necessity is broken she might rise now and i saw that she still lay motionless on the sand with her eyes open and her neck stretched out and she seemed to look for something on the far-off border of the desert that never came and i wondered if she were awake or asleep and as i looked her body quivered and a light came into her eyes like when a sunbeam breaks into a dark room i said what is it he whispered hush the thought has come to her might i not rise and i looked and she raised her head from the sand and i saw the dent where her neck had lain so long and she looked at the earth and she looked at the sky and she looked at him who stood by her but he looked out across the desert and i saw her body quiver and she pressed her front knees to the earth and veins stood out and i cried she is going to rise but only her sides heaved and she lay still where she was but her head she held up she did not lay it down again and he beside me said she is very weak see her legs have been crushed under her so long and i saw the creature struggle and the drops stood out on her and i said surely he who stands beside her will help her and he beside me answered he cannot help her she must help herself let her struggle till she is strong and i cried at least he will not hinder her see he moves farther from her and tightens the cord between them and he drags her down and he answered he does not understand when she moves she draws the band that binds them and hurts him and he moves further from her the day will come when he will understand and will know what she is doing let her once stagger on to her knees in that day he will stand close to her and look into her eyes with sympathy and she stretched her neck and the drops fell from her and the creature rose an inch from the earth and sank back and i cried oh she is too weak she cannot walk the long years have taken all her strength from her can she never move and he answered me see the light in her eyes and slowly the creature staggered on to its knees and i awoke and all to the east and to the west stretched the barren earth with the dry bushes on it the ants ran up and down in the red sand and the heat beat fiercely i looked up through the thin branches of the tree at the sky overhead i stretched myself and i mused over the dream i had had and i fell asleep again with my head on my saddle and in the fierce heat i had another dream i saw a desert and i saw a woman coming out of it and she came to the bank of a dark river and the bank was steep and high footnote 
the banks of an african river are sometimes a hundred feet high and consist of deep shifting sands through which in the course of ages the river has worn its gigantic bed End of footnote. and on it an old man met her who had a long white beard and a stick that curled was in his hand and on it was written reason and he asked her what she wanted and she said i am woman and i am seeking for the land of freedom and he said it is before you and she said i see nothing before me but a dark flowing river and a bank steep and high and cuttings here and there with heavy sand in them and he said and beyond that she said i see nothing but sometimes when i shade my eyes with my hand i think i see on the further bank trees and hills and the sun shining on them he said that is the land of freedom she said how am i to get there he said there is one way and one only down the banks of labor through the water of suffering there is no other she said is there no bridge he answered none she said is the water deep he said deep she said is the floor worn he said it is your foot may slip at any time and you may be lost she said have any crossed already he said some have tried she said is there a track to show where the best fording is he said it has to be made she shaded her eyes with her hand and she said i will go and he said you must take off the clothes you wore in the desert they are dragged down by them who go into the water so clothed and she threw from her gladly the mantle of ancient received opinions she wore for it was worn full of holes and she took the girdle from her waist that she had treasured so long and the moths flew out of it in a cloud and he said take the shoes of dependence off your feet and she stood there naked but for one white garment that clung close to her and he said that you may keep so they wear clothes in the land of freedom in the water it buoys it always swims and i saw on its breast was written truth and it was white the sun had not often shone on it the other clothes had covered it up and he said take this stick hold it fast in that day when it slips from your hand you are lost put it down before you feel your way where it cannot find a bottom do not set your foot and she said i am ready let me go and he said no but stay what is that in your breast she was silent he said open it and let me see and she opened it and against her breast was a tiny thing who drank from it and the yellow curls above his forehead pressed against it and his knees were drawn up to her and he held her breast fast with his hands and reason said who is he and what is he doing here and she said see his little wings and reason said put him down and she said he is asleep and he is drinking i will carry him to the land of freedom he has been a child so long so long and i have carried him in the land of freedom he will be a man we will walk together there and his great white wings will overshadow me he has lisped one word only to me in the desert passion i have dreamed he might learn to say friendship in that land and reason said put him down and she said i will carry him so with one arm and with the other i will fight the water and he said 
lay him down on the ground when you are in the water you will forget to fight you will think only of him lay him down he said he will not die when he finds you have left him alone he will open his wings and fly he will be in the land of freedom before you those who reach the land of freedom the first hand they see stretching down the bank to help them shall be loves he will be a man then not a child in your breast he cannot thrive put him down that he may grow and she took her bosom from his mouth and he bit her so that the blood ran down on to the ground and she laid him down on the earth and she covered her wound and she bent and stroked his wings and i saw the hair on her forehead turn white as snow and she had changed from youth to age and she stood far off on the bank of the river and she said for what do i go to this land which no one has ever reached oh i am alone i am utterly alone and reason that old man said to her silence what do you hear and she listened intently and she said i hear a sound of feet a thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands and they beat this way he said they are the feet of those who shall follow you lead on make a track to the water's edge where you stand now the ground will be beaten flat by ten thousand times ten thousand feet and he said have you seen the locusts how they cross a stream first one comes down to the water's edge and it is swept away and then another comes and then another and then another and at last with their bodies piled up a bridge is built and the rest pass over she said and of those that come first some are swept away and are heard of no more their bodies do not even build the bridge and are swept away and are heard of no more and what of that he said and what of that she said they make a track to the water's edge they make a track to the water's edge and she said over that bridge which shall be built with our bodies who will pass he said the entire human race and the woman grasped her staff and i saw her turn down that dark path to the river and i awoke and all about me was the yellow afternoon light the sinking sun lit up the fingers of the milk bushes and my horse stood by me quietly feeding and i turned on my side and i watched the ants run by thousands in the red sand i thought i would go on my way now the afternoon was cooler then a drowsiness crept over me again and i lay back my head and fell asleep and i dreamed a dream i dreamed i saw a land and on the hills walked brave women and brave men hand in hand and they looked into each other's eyes and they were not afraid and i saw the women also hold each other's hands and i said to him beside me what place is this and he said this is heaven and i said where is it and he answered on earth and i said when shall these things be and he answered in the future and i awoke and all about me was the sunset light and on the low hills the sun lay and a delicious coolness had crept over everything and the ants were going slowly home and i walked towards my horse who stood quietly feeding then the sun passed down behind the hills but i knew that the next day he would arise again end of section four section five of dreams by olive schreiner this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian 
Chapter Six A Dream of Wild Bees. A mother sat alone at an open window. Through it came the voices of the children as they played under the acacia trees and the breath of the hot afternoon air. In and out of the room flew the bees, the wild bees, with their legs yellow with pollen, going to and from the acacia trees, droning all the while. She sat on a low chair before the table and darned. She took her work from the great basket that stood before her on the table. Some lay on her knee and half covered the book that rested there. She watched the needle go in and out, and the dreary hum of the bees and the noise of the children's voices became a confused murmur in her ears, as she worked slowly and more slowly. Then the bees, the long-legged wasp-like fellows who make no honey, flew closer and closer to her head, droning. Then she grew more and more drowsy, and she laid her hand, with the stocking over it, on the edge of the table, and leaned her head upon it. And the voices of the children outside grew more and more dreamy, came now far, now near. Then she did not hear them. But she felt under her heart where the ninth child lay. Bent forward and sleeping there, with the bees flying about her head, she had a weird brain picture. She thought the bees lengthened and lengthened themselves out and became human creatures, and moved round and round her. Then one came to her softly, saying, Let me lay my hand upon thy side where the child sleeps. If I shall touch him, he shall be as I. She asked, Who are you? And he said, I am Health, whom I touch, will have always the red blood dancing in his veins. He will not know weariness or pain. Life will be a long laugh to him. No, said another, let me touch, for I am wealth. If I touch him, material care shall not feed on him. He shall live on the blood and sinews of his fellow men, if he will. And what his eye lusts for, his hand will have. He shall not know, I want. And the child lay still like lead. And another said, Let me touch him. I am fame. The man I touch, I lead to a high hill where all men may see him. When he dies, he is not forgotten. His name rings down the centuries. Each echoes it on to his fellows. Think not to be forgotten through the ages. And the mother lay breathing steadily, but in the brain picture they pressed closer to her. Let me touch the child, said one, for I am love. If I touch him he shall not walk through life alone. In the greatest dark, when he puts out his hand, he shall find another hand by it. When the world is against him, another shall say, you and I. And the child trembled. But another pressed close and said, Let me touch, for I am talent. I can do all things that have been done before. I touch the soldier, the statesman, the thinker, and the politician who succeed, and the writer who is never before his time, and never behind it. If I touch the child, he shall not weep for failure. About the mother's head the bees were flying, touching her with their long tapering limbs, and, in her brain picture, out of the shadow of the room came one with sallow face, deep-lined, the cheeks drawn into hollows, and a mouth smiling quiveringly. He stretched out his hand, and the mother drew back and cried, Who are you? He answered nothing and she looked up between his eyelids, and she said, What can you give the child, health? And he said, The man I touch, there wakes up in his blood a burning fever that shall lick his blood as fire. The fever that I will give him shall be cured when his life is cured. You give wealth? He shook his head. The man whom I touch, when he bends to pick up gold, 
he sees suddenly a light over his head in the sky. While he looks up to see it, the gold slips from between his fingers, or sometimes another passing takes it from them. Fame? He answered, lightly not, for the man I touch, there is a path traced out in the sand by a finger which no man sees, that he must follow. Sometimes it leads almost to the top, and then turns down suddenly into the valley. He must follow it, though none else sees the tracing. Love? He said, he shall hunger for it, but ye shall not find it. When he stretches out his arms to it, and would lay his heart against a thing he loves, then far off along the horizon he shall see a light play. He must go towards it. The thing he loves will not journey with him. He must travel alone. When he presses somewhat to his burning heart, crying, Mine, mine, my own, he shall hear a voice, Renounce, renounce, this is not thine. He shall succeed? He said, he shall fail. When he runs with others, they shall reach the goal before him. For strange voices shall call to him, and strange lights shall beckon him, and he must wait and listen. And this shall be the strangest. Far off across the burning sands, where, to other men, there is only the desert's waste, he shall see a blue sea. On that sea the sun shines always, and the water is blue as burning amethyst, and the foam is white on the shore. A great land rises from it, and he shall see upon the mountain tops burning gold. The mother said, He shall reach it? And he smiled curiously. She said, It is real? And he said, What is real? And she looked up between his half-closed eyelids and said, Touch. And he leaned forward and laid his hand upon the sleeper and whispered to it, smiling, and this only she heard, This shall be thy reward, that the ideal shall be real to thee. And the child trembled, but the mother slept on heavily, and her brain picture vanished. But deep within her, the antenatal thing that lay there had a dream. In those eyes that had never seen the day, in that half-shaped brain, was a sensation of light. Light that it never had seen. Light that perhaps it never should see. Light that existed somewhere. And already it had its reward. The ideal was real to it. London End of section 5「Section six of Dreams by Olive Schreiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Chapter seven in a ruined chapel. I cannot forgive. I love. There are four bare walls. There is a Christ upon the walls in red, carrying his cross. There is a blessed bambino with the face rubbed out. There is a Madonna in blue and red. There are Roman soldiers and a Christ with tied hands. All the roof is gone. Overhead is the blue, blue Italian sky. The rain has beaten holes in the walls and the plaster is peeling from it. The chapel stands here alone upon the promontory and by day and by night the sea breaks at its feet. Some say that it was set here by the monks from the island down below, that they might bring their sick here in times of deadly plague. Some say that it was set here that the passing monks and friars, as they hurried by upon the roadway, might stop and say their prayers here. Now no one stops to pray here, and the sick come no more to be healed. Behind it runs the old Roman road. If you climb it and come and sit here alone on a hot sunny day, you may almost hear at last 
the clink of the roman soldiers upon the pavement and the sound of that older time as you sit there in the sun when hannibal and his men broke through the brushwood and no road was now it is very quiet sometimes a peasant girl comes riding by between her panniers and you hear the mule's feet beat upon the bricks of the pavement sometimes an old woman goes past with a bundle of weeds upon her head or a brigand-looking man hurries by with a bundle of sticks in his hand but for the rest the chapel lies here alone upon the promontory between the two bays and hears the sea break at its feet i came here one winter's day when the midday sun shone hot on the bricks of the roman road i was weary and the way seemed steep i walked into the chapel to the broken window and looked out across the bay far off across the blue blue water were towns and villages hanging white and red dots upon the mountain sides and the blue mountains rose up into the sky and now stood out from it and now melted back again the mountains seemed calling to me but i knew there would never be a bridge built from them to me never 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 i shaded my eyes with my hand and turned away i could not bear to look at them i walked through the ruined chapel and looked at the christ in red carrying his cross and the blessed rubbed out bambino and the roman soldiers and the folded hands and the reed and i went and sat down in the open porch upon a stone at my feet was the small bay with its white row of houses buried among the olive trees the water broke in a long thin white line of foam along the shore and i leaned my elbows on my knees i was tired very tired tired with a tiredness that seemed older than the heat of the day and the shining of the sun on the bricks of the roman road and i lay my head upon my knees i heard the breaking of the water on the rocks three hundred feet below and the rustling of the wind among the olive trees and the ruined arches and then i fell asleep there i had a dream a man cried up to god and god sent down an angel to help him and the angel came back and said i cannot help that man god said how is it with him and the angel said he cries out continually that one has injured him and he would forgive him and he cannot god said what have you done for him the angel said all i took him by the hand and i said see when other men speak ill of that man do you speak well of him secretly in ways he shall not know serve him if you have anything you value share it with him so serving him you will at last come to feel possession in him and you will forgive and he said i will do it afterwards as i passed by in the dark of night i heard one crying out i have done all it helps nothing my speaking well of him helps me nothing if i share my heart's blood with him is the burning within me less i cannot forgive i cannot forgive o oh god i cannot forgive i said to him see here look back on all your past see from your childhood all smallness all indirectness that has been yours look well at it and in its light do you not see every man your brother are you so sinless you have a right to hate he looked and said yes you are right i too have failed and i forgive my fellow go i am satisfied i have forgiven and he laid him down peacefully and folded his hands on his breast and i thought it was well with him but scarcely had my wings rustled and i turned to come up here when i heard one crying out on earth again i cannot forgive i cannot forgive o oh god god i cannot forgive 
it is better to die than to hate i cannot forgive i cannot forgive and i went and stood outside his door in the dark and i heard him cry i have not sinned so not so if i have torn my fellow's flesh ever so little i have kneeled down and kissed the wound with my mouth till it was healed i have not willed that any soul shall be lost through hate of me if they have but fancied that i wronged them i have lain down on the ground before them that they might tread on me and so seeing my humiliation forgive and not be lost through hating me they have not cared that my soul should be lost they have not willed to save me they have not tried that i should forgive them i said to him see here be thou content do not forgive forget this soul and its injury go on your way in the next world perhaps he cried go from me you understand nothing what is the next world to me i am lost now to-day i cannot see the sunlight shine the dust is in my throat the sand is in my eyes go from me you know nothing oh once again before i die to see that the world is beautiful o oh god god i cannot live and not love i cannot live and hate o oh god 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 so i left him crying out and came back here god said this man's soul must be saved and the angel said how god said go down you and save it the angel said what more shall i do then god bent down and whispered in the angel's ear and the angel spread out its wings and went down to earth and partly i woke sitting there upon the broken stone with my head on my knee but i was too weary to rise i heard the wind roam through the olive trees and among the ruined arches and then i slept again the angel went down and found the man with the bitter heart and took him by the hand and led him to a certain spot now the man wist not where it was the angel would take him nor what he would show him there and when they came the angel shaded the man's eyes with his wing and when he moved it the man saw somewhat on the earth before them for god had given it to that angel to unclothe a human soul to take from it all the outward attributes of form and colour and age and sex whereby one man is known from among his fellows and is marked off from the rest and the soul lay before them bare as a man turning his eye inward beholds himself they saw its past its childhood the tiny life with the dew upon it and the creature raised its lilliputian mouth to drink from a cup too large for it and they saw how the water spilt they saw its hopes that were never realized they saw its hours of intellectual blindness men call sin they saw its hours of all radiating insight which men call righteousness they saw its hour of strength when it leapt to its feet crying i am omnipotent its hour of weakness when it fell to the earth and grasped dust only they saw what it might have been but never would be the man bent forward and the angel said what is it he answered it is i it is myself and he went forward as if he would have lain his heart against it but the angel held him back and covered his eyes now god had given power to the angel further to unclothe that soul to take from it all those outward attributes of time and place and circumstance whereby the individual life is marked off from the life of the whole again the angel uncovered the man's eyes and he looked he saw before him that which in its tiny drop reflects the whole universe he saw that which marks within itself the step of the furthest star and tells how the crystal grows under the ground where no eye has seen it that which is where the germ in the egg stirs which moves the outstretched fingers of the little newborn babe and keeps the leaves of the trees pointing upward 
which moves where the jellyfish sail alone on the sunny seas and is where the lichens form on the mountain's rocks and the man looked and the angel touched him but the man bowed his head and shuddered he whispered it is god and the angel recovered the man's eyes and when he uncovered them there was one walking from them a little way off for the angel had reclothed the soul in its outward form and vesture and the man knew who it was and the angel said do you know him and the man said i know him and looked after the figure and the angel said have you forgiven him but the man said how beautiful my brother is and the angel looked into the man's eyes and he shaded his own face with his wing from the light he laughed softly and went up to god but the men were together on earth i awoke the blue blue sky was over my head and the waves were breaking below on the shore i walked through the little chapel and i saw the madonna in blue and red and the christ carrying his cross and the roman soldiers with the rod and the blessed bambino with its broken face and then i walked down the sloping rock to the brick pathway the olive trees stood up on either side of the road their black berries and pale green leaves stood out against the sky and the little ice plants hung from the crevices in the stone wall it seemed to me as if it must have rained while i was asleep i thought i had never seen the heavens and the earth look so beautiful before i walked down the road the old 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 tiredness was gone presently there came a peasant boy down the path leading his ass she had two large panniers fastened to her sides and they went down the road before me i had never seen him before but i should have liked to walk by him and to have held his hand only he would not have known why alasio italy end of section 6section seven of dreams by olive schreiner this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian chapter eight life's gifts i saw a woman sleeping in her sleep she dreamt life stood before her and held in each hand a gift in the one love in the other freedom and she said to the woman choose and the woman waited long and she said freedom and life said thou hast chosen well if thou hadst said love i would have given thee that thou didst ask for and i would have gone from thee and returned to thee no more now the day will come when i shall return in that day i shall bear both gifts in one hand i heard the woman laugh in her sleep london chapter nine the artist's secret there was an artist once and he painted a picture other artists had colors richer and rarer and painted more notable pictures he painted his with one color there was a wonderful red glow on it and the people went up and down saying we like the picture we like the glow the other artists came and said where does he get his color from they asked him and he smiled and said i cannot tell you and worked on with his head bent low and one went to the far east and bought costly pigments and made a rare color and painted but after a time the picture faded another read in the old books and made a color rich and rare but when he had put it on the picture it was dead but the artist painted on always the work got redder and redder 
and the artist grew whiter and whiter. At last one day they found him dead before his picture, and they took him up to bury him. The other men looked about in all the pots and crucibles, but they found nothing they had not. And when they undressed him to put his grave clothes on him, they found above his left breast the mark of a wound. It was an old, old wound that must have been there all his life, for the edges were old and hardened. But death, who seals all things, had drawn the edges together and closed it up. And they buried him, and still the people went about saying, Where did he find his colour from? And it came to pass that after a while the artist was forgotten, but the work lived. St. Leonard's on Sea Chapter 10 I Thought I Stood Part 1 I thought I stood in heaven before God's throne, and God asked me what I had come for. I said I had come to arraign my brother, man. God said, What has he done? I said, He has taken my sister, woman, and has stricken her, and wounded her, and thrust her out into the streets. She lies there prostrate. His hands are red with blood. I am here to arraign him, that the kingdom be taken from him, because he is not worthy, and given unto me. My hands are pure. I showed them. God said, Thy hands are pure, lift up thy robe. I raised it. My feet were red, blood red, as if I had trodden in wine. God said, How is this? I said, Dear Lord, the streets on earth are full of mire. If I should walk straight on in them, my outer robe might be bespotted. You see how white it is. Therefore I pick my way. God said, On what? I was silent, and I let my robe fall. I wrapped my mantle about my head. I went out softly. I was afraid that the angels would see me. Part 2 Once more I stood at the gate of heaven. I and another. We held fast by one another. We were very tired. We looked up at the great gates. The angels opened them, and we went in. The mud was on our garments. We walked across the marble floor and up to the great throne. Then the angels divided us. Her they set upon the top step, but me upon the bottom, for they said, Last time this woman came here, she left red footmarks on the floor. We had to wash them out with our tears. Let her not go up. Then she with whom I came looked back and stretched out her hand to me, and I went and stood beside her. And the angels, they, the shining ones, who never sinned and never suffered, walked by us to and fro and up and down. I think we should have felt a little lonely there if it had not been for one another. The angels were so bright. God asked me what I had come for, and I drew my sister forward a little that he might see her. God said, How is it you are here together today? I said, She was upon the ground in the street, and they passed over her. I lay down by her, and she put her arms around my neck, and so I lifted her, and we two rose together. God said, Whom are you now come to accuse before me? I said, We are come to accuse no man. And God bent and said, My children, what is it that ye seek? And she beside me drew my hand that I should speak for both. I said, We have come to ask that thou should speak to man our brother, and give us a message for him, that he might understand, and that he might, God said, go, take the message down to him. 
I said, but what is the message? God said, upon your heart it is written, take it down to him. And we turned to go. The angels went with us to the door. They looked at us. And one said, Ay, but their dresses are beautiful. And the other said, I thought it was Maya when they came in. But see, it is all golden. But another said, Hush, it is the light from their faces. And we went down to him. Alasio, Italy End of section 7